morning, Psalm chapter 42. You ready? Told you, told you we'd be out of here soon, but let's get to this truth this morning. Psalm 42, and uh, let's just read, uh, let's read, uh, we're going to read Psalm 42 and Psalm 43. I want you to notice something, and tell me when we read them, tell me what you notice here as being peculiar. Psalm 42, verse number 1, As the heart panteth after the water brook, so panteth my soul after thee, O God. My soul thirsteth for God, for the living God. When shall I come and appear before God? My tears have been by me day and night, while they continually say unto me, Where is thy God? When I remember these things, I pour out my soul in me, for I had gone with the multitude. I went with them to the house of God, with the voice of joy and praise, with the multitude that kept holy day. And then notice verse number five. Why art thou cast down, O my soul? And why art thou disquieted in me? Hope thou in God, for I shall yet praise him for the help of his countenance. Now notice verse number six. O my God, my soul is cast down within me. Therefore will I remember thee from the land of Jordan, of the Hermonites, from the hill of Mizar, from the hill Mizar, deep calleth unto deep at the noise of thy water spouts, all thy waves and thy billows are going over me. Yet the Lord will command his loving kindness in the daytime, and in the night his song shall be with me, and my prayer unto the God of my life. Man, this song preaches its own sermon, doesn't it? And uh, verse number nine, I will say unto God, my rock, why hast thou forgotten me? Why go I mourning because of the oppression of the enemy? As with a sword in my bones, mine enemies reproach me while they say daily unto me, where is thy God? Look at this verse. Have you noticed this before? Verse 11, why art thou cast down, O my soul? And why art thou disquieted within me? Hope thou in God, for I shall yet praise him who is the health of my countenance and my God. You recognize that verse? Did we not just read a moment ago that same verse? That same verse just a moment ago, pass her back to her grandmother. I want you to listen. All right, verse number 43. Psalm 43, verse number 1. Judge me, O God, and plead my cause against an ungodly nation. O deliver me from the deceitful and unjust man, for thou art the God of my strength. Why dost thou cast me off? Why go I mourning because of the oppression of the enemy? Listen. Oh, send out thy light and thy truth. Let them lead me and let them bring me into the holy hill and to thy tabernacle. Then will I go unto the altar of God and to God my exceeding joy. Yea, upon the harp will I praise thee, O God, my God. You recognize this next verse? Why art thou cast down, O my soul? And why art thou disquieted within me? Hope in God, for I shall yet praise him who is the health of my countenance and my God. Anybody notice something odd there? In two chapters, we read the identical verse three times. I mean, can somebody tell me why in the world God would put the same verse three times in two chapters? I mean, if it's in, if it's, in there once in one chapter, or more than once, that's kind of odd, wouldn't you think? But here we have two chapters, the very same verse, word for word, as far as I know, as far as I can see, word for word, twice in two chapters. The first chapter, there's 11 verses, and in the second chapter, there's five verses, so 11 and 5 makes how many? 16. Very good. So 11 and 5 makes 16, and so... Three out of 16 verses are identical, the exact same word. Why in the world would you say it three times? Unless God has something he wants to teach us there. I want to preach a message this morning with this title, with this question. What happened to me? What happened to me? You ever ask that question, what happened to me? You ever ask the question, how did I get here? How did I 
I get in this situation? How did I get in this predicament? What happened? There's a lot of folks ask that question, and they may not say it outwardly. They may not walk up to you and say, hey, can you help me? I'm somewhere I never thought I'd be. How did I get here? But the truth of the matter is, I believe that at one point or another in everybody's life, that question comes to mind, and you think, how did I get in this situation? How did I get in this place? I didn't plan to be here. How did I get here? And he says here, the verse says, why art thou cast down, O my soul? Why art thou disquieted within me? What, what happened to me? Why are you cast down? Why, why are you sad? Why am I down? And used to use the world's word, why am I depressed? Why does it seem like the weight of the world is on me? Why am I miserable? Why am I broken hearted? Why am I grieved the way I am? Why? What happened to me? Where did my joy go? Where did my happiness go? Where did my love for life go? Where did my that vigor go? Where did that gleam in my eye go? You ever see a little child, and, and, and it's one of the reasons why, man, listen, I, I, I love our church, and I, I love to see the little children here, because it changes as they get older, you know, and as they become teenagers. I mean, uh, we, we've I've already had two disappear. One, one disappeared from the service. One of our teenagers, I lost him, disappeared on us. And uh, was on the back row. I don't even see him anymore. But uh, but listen, I, I don't know what happens to people. I don't know what what happens. It seems like it seems like that somehow or another uh, life, you know, just kind of gets the best of you. I mean, you just kind of get overwhelmed. You know, just you kind of uh, you kind of find yourself in a situation where where it seems like maybe everybody's against you and God doesn't even love you anymore. And mom and dad don't understand the situation you're in. It's not just young people, but it's adults get that way. Oh, my, my husband doesn't know what I'm going through and he doesn't understand and I can't tell him. But boy, that fellow at work, he understands my situation. I can talk to him or, or that man will say, you know what, my wife doesn't know the load that I carry and doesn't understand. But that woman I met out there, you know, sitting there in that place I shouldn't have been, uh, sitting there. She understands my situation. Uh, she listens to me. She knows what I'm going through. I'm going to tell you something. I'm going to tell you, we talk ourselves into a lot of trouble. We think ourselves into a whole lot of stuff. Listen, and just as easy as we can talk ourselves into trouble and think ourselves into a mess, we can talk ourselves out of it and think ourselves out of it. If you this morning think or underestimate the power of your mind, if we underestimate the power of our thoughts, we're in deep trouble. You can think yourself into misery. You can think yourself into sadness. You can think yourself into feeling like no one cares about you. No one loves you. But that's a lie, friend. That's not true. And the devil looks for that person who will allow their mind to become a playground for his stupid thoughts and his foolishness. And that person that will entertain the junk that he'll program in and throw in. That's who the devil's looking for. Is that you? Is that where I want to be? Is that the ride I want to go on? Do I want to set up here five or six months from now and say, what happened to me? Why is my soul disquieted within me? I remember being happy. I remember joy. Hey, I remember going to church and singing the songs, and I was glad to hear the songs, and I wanted to get to the house of God, and I couldn't wait to hear the preaching, but now it's a misery. Now it's a drudge. Now I just endure it. Now it's a burden. Now I wish I didn't even have to go. Now I don't go. Well, I remember when it was fun. Now I go because I have to. Mom and Dad made me. I don't need anything out of it. They're all a bunch of sinners over there anyway. Church is full of hypocrites. Well, wow, so and so. I mean, I watch him sing those songs, but I know what he's really like. I've heard him. He said a word he shouldn't have said. I heard him say it. He's just a hypocrite. Well, the preacher, he ain't for real either. He's a big liar. He's a big fake. He's a big phony. It's amazing. Once you've been around church for a while, how you can see Christians go from. What happened to me? How did I get here? What happened? Why art thou cast down, O my soul? And why art thou disquieted within me? Hope in God. For I shall yet pray.
praise him who is the health of my what? Count, you know the countenance doesn't lie. You know the Lord says to a man in the Bible named Cain, he said, Cain, why is that countenance falling? Why do you look that way, Cain? If you think that you can fool somebody, you're wrong. Because your countenance tells the truth. It reveals your heart. Same for me. What happened to your countenance? Who's the hell? How do you get your countenance right again? How do you get joy again? How do you get joy unspeakable and full of glory? Hey, how do you get over that pity party? How do you get over it? How do you get out of those depths? And how do you get out of that hole? And how do you rise up from defeat? And how do you not say, God, why have you been unkind to me? Why have you been unfair to me? God, what's wrong? How do you get back to where you ought to be again? I call that revival, don't you? Yeah. I call that getting back to the place where you wake up in the morning with a song in your heart and listen and there's joy and, and you're, you're mindful of the blessings of God and that song counts your many blessings name them one by one and listen and throughout the day there's a song in your heart and you read your Bible and the Bible's alive and it speaks to you hey those are good days I've lived some days I, I know I'm not, I'm not making up anything I've lived all these days I'm telling you about I 10 million times 10 million rather live those days where the fire of God is burning in my heart and where there's joy and there's rejoicing and there's a smile in my heart and there's a smile on my face and I don't even know why. And I see it all the time. Those who are just enduring this life. More and more you see it in our society. Man. You think you're going to get better watching the news? Forget about it. If I watch the news all week long, I don't know if I'd be alive or not. I don't know if I could t take much of it. I'd either kill somebody or kill myself. I don't know. I mean, I know that sounds bad, but I'm just telling you the truth. I couldn't listen to all that stuff all the time. I got to get away from it. Look here, the three things. Because he says three times the same thing. I want to show you why I believe he says the first time he said this. Look, this is an odd thing. In Psalm 43, everything's going good. He said, now in the first in the first Psalm, Psalm 42, look at it. As the heart panteth at the water brook, so panteth what? My soul. See that individual. My soul after thee, O God. My soul. See that? Real quick. We're going to go real quick. My soul thirsteth for God, for the living God. When shall I come? See that singular pronoun there. I. When shall I come and appear before my God? My tears have been my meat day and night, while they continually say unto me, Where is thy God? Wait a minute. Everything was good until it became a plurality. In David's life, he said, my heart panted. He said, I, all these things. Can I tell you something? He, everything's going good until he gets around company. Yep. Look what the very next verse says. It says this, when I remember these things, I pour out my soul, my soul in me, for I had gone with the multitude and with them uh, to the house of God with the voice of joy and praise with a multitude that kept holy day. There's a big difference, listen, there's a big difference between an individual and a multitude. Every time, look at this, look at the, the, the very next thing here. He said, I went with the multitude of them that where? That kept holy day. Wouldn't you think, wouldn't you think that going to church would make things better. But it's a sad thing here that in this song, it appears like the crowd that David gathered with, that he went to the house of God with, the multitude that kept holy day, it appears like that after he gathered with this crowd, he was doing good by himself. He was doing good as an individual. And he was doing well out there taking care of the sheepfold. But all of a sudden, he got with a group of people who kept holy day, a religious crowd, and all of a sudden, now he's down in the press. It's amazing to me that, listen, I grew up in church. I grew up around the house of God. But you know, you'll find this to be true. Church can depress you just as much as anybody else can. They, listen, 
God's people can be just as sour and rotten and, and miserable, and it ought not to be that way. There are some congregations that you can go in as a believer, and you can go in on fire for God, wanting to do something, and you get in there, and those people say, oh, no, wait a minute, wait a minute here. Now, we don't need that kind. That's, that's wildfire. You know what you are? Uh, you're, a, you're a radical. You need to calm down a little bit. Now listen, you need to tone it down some. I remember Ray Anderson talking about that all the time. He said the preachers would come to him in some churches, and, and I can't remember the word that he used to use. Uh, it's a simple word, but they would say to him, Look, you're, you're a radical. You're too crazy. You're wildfire. You need to calm down some. Listen, hey, I say to you this morning that that's not true. Amen. Amen. Would to God, we as God's people would come to church with the scent of revival in our heart and fellowship with God, and we'd come into church and you just open your song book up and sing, and if nobody else sings, don't tone it down because everybody else is standing there look like they've been afflicted by Christianity. Go ahead and sing the song to Jesus. Don't let other people discourage how you worship the Lord. Don't let other people affect how you fellowship with the Lord. David was doing well when it was just him and God. But when he got in the multitude, and sadly the multitude that he was with was at the church house. And when he got with the crowd, not, not the worldly crowd, but the church crowd. Now look, we better check ourselves. How does the church go sour? One person at a time. Negativity slips into the congregation and a sour spirit slips in. And listen, and before long, everybody's the same way. Everybody gets that way. But all it takes is a few people to just say, you know what? I'm going to walk with God. I'm going to talk with God. I'm going to go to the Lord's house. I'm going to sing and shout and praise the Lord and rejoice and have a smile on my face and act like everything's wonderful. Amen. You know what? It'll change the spirit of the church. If your church isn't where it ought to be, you don't have to necessarily leave. At first, just see if a good Christian attitude might not be infectious there. Amen? Amen. You can shake your head every once in a while. You can agree. Amen? You can agree. You know, young people are especially are especially affected by the spirit of the church, the attitude of God's people. There are churches all over the place. Listen, you go in and uh, I, you, you say, well, we're going to do this. And we'll say, oh, we can't do that. Let's, let's go. Let's go. I try to do this. Oh, we can't do that. We can't do this. We can't do that. You know, that's a sad thing. And somehow or another, I believe that David was discouraged. Not in the bar room. Not in the house of repute. But I believe the first great discouragement in his life came in the assembly of God's people. Well, I think he got to the church house and he saw that the people were fake, hypocritical. He had a genuine love for God. He had a zeal in his heart, a longing as the heart panted after the water brooks. But he got around the religious people and he saw that the people didn't really pursue God like they said they did. Many of them just showed up and it looked like they were interested, but they just lived as wicked and carnal. And it hurt him. And I'm going to promise you this one of the great disappointments in your life is finding out that not all the people who profess to be God's people really have a desire to know God. Amen. You're going to have to learn in life to overlook a lot of people who profess to be Christians. And not allow them to change your relationship with God. Not allow their bad spirit. Not allow their, their odd, their, their dis, uh, disjointed attitude. Not allow God's people to affect how you worship the Lord. Joshua said, but as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Amen. Hey, I'm going to come, and I'm going to get my songbook out, and I'm going to sing if nobody else sings. Amen. And I'm going to rejoice, and I'm going to look at my Bible, and I'm going to be glad when I go to the house of God. Next time is this. Something happened in David's life, and I, I don't know, but that's the first time, but then he... Then he said here in Psalm number 42, he said, Oh my God, my soul is cast down within me. Right after this verse number 5, my soul is cast down. Now what happens? He said, Therefore will I remember thee 
from the land of Jordan and of the Hermonites and from the hill Mizar. Now, I want to show you something. Deep call from the deep and the noise of thy water spouts. All thy waves and thy billows are going over me. Yet the Lord will command his loving kindness in the daytime and in the night his song shall be with me and my prayer to the God of my life. You see, he's still religious. He hasn't rejected God. But I want to show you what happened. He said, I will say unto God, my rock, why hast thou forgotten me? Does God ever forget you? Has God ever, will God ever forget you? Well, I'll show you what's wrong here in just a second. We're going to see it. Why go I mourning because of the oppression of the enemy? As with the sword in my bones, my enemies reproach me while they say unto me, where they say daily, how often? Daily unto me, where is thy God? Here's the problem. We sing the song, I shall not be, I shall not be moved, just like a tree planted by the waters. I shall not be moved. You see, David was in good, he was doing well. And something happened in the first part. The first time you see that verse, oh my, thou, uh, why art thou cast down on my soul? And because of that, it moves David from his place. Gets him off course. Let me show you what I mean. He said in verse number 6 of chapter 42, I will remember thee from the land of Jordan, of the Hermonites, and from the hill of Isar. You know what he's doing? He's getting further and further away from where he's supposed to be. Instead of moving closer to God, He's fallen directly into the snare and the trap of the devil. He's getting further and further from God. He's not denouncing God. He's not rejecting God. He's just moving ever so slightly, a little bit further, a little bit further. This is how the devil operates. This is how he works. A little further. He said, I'm going to remember God. And actually, his worship and remembrance of God becomes a pity party. So much to the place where he gets in his life, he said, my enemies persecute me daily. Now, wait a minute. Why is he doing it? He went, from the, he went from being alone with God and doing well to going to the church house and being in a company of believers that were hypocrites. Now, all of a sudden, he's in the presence of God's enemies daily. We had a man in the church here, one of the greatest fellows I've ever known. And this man said he got saved in the 1960s. And he said he one time he was at a, a church function and he saw some very, very sickening, hypocritical stuff by some of the leaders of the church. And he said he got out of church. Up to that point, he'd been very involved in church, very involved. But he got out of church. He got put off by the things that he saw. Up until that point, he would go with the preacher to all the revivals. I mean, he was just on fire for God. But almost 20 years passed. From the time he made the decision to get out of church, over 20 years, almost 30 years passed. And he engaged in all kinds of worldly, wicked stuff. And he estranged himself from the people of God. And he joined up with the enemies of God. He said that every day it afflicted him. Look what they said here. Where is your God? Isn't it funny how when the devil gets you away from God and in that place like that, then he'll come along and say, hey, where's your God? Hey, what's he trying to do? He's trying to shake David's faith. That's what he's trying to do. Where's your God? Listen, whenever you get away from the place where God would have you to be and you allow something to move you from where God would have you to be, whatever it is, it might be a legitimate thing, but you get away from it and little by little you say, you know what? I'm tired of those hypocrites. I'm not going to forget God. But little by little you're moving further and further and further away and you find yourself in the world and in the place of despondency and despair now you're in real trouble because now the enemies of God are there 
Sin and all its allurements are there. Temptation is there. Things that you never thought you would experience before. Things that you never imagined before are there. And you're having thoughts and contemplating feelings that you never thought would come into your mind. Because don't you doubt for one minute that when they're saying, David, where's your God? David wasn't saying, where is God? Maybe this thing is fake. You know, there was a time in David's life when he was willing to side up with the enemies of God's people. He was willing to turn himself into a soldier for the enemies of his own nation. And so doing, I think he would have had to have rejected God to do that. You'd be surprised. You'd be amazed at how far you can go with a Christian. If you just keep going. And all the time you're going away, you're saying, you know what, I'm not going to forget God. I will remember God from Jordan. God, I remember you in the Hermonites. God, all the way down here in the hill of Mizar, I remember you. Until daily, he was afflicted by the enemies of God. And now it's not just his own mind, but it's the enemies of God saying, hey, is this thing for real or not? This is a bunch of phonies, a bunch of fakes. Is God real? Where is God? That's a bad place to be, friend. It's a bad place to be. So here he says, verse number 10, as with, verse chapter 42, as with a sword in my bones, look at this, my enemies reproach me. You know you can get so far in sin that it begins to affect you physically. I mean, it begins to take a toll on you. It begins to wear on you. Where is thy God? And then for the second time in verse number 11, he says, Why art thou cast down, O my soul? And why art thou disquieted within me? Hope thou in God, for I shall yet praise him who is the health of my countenance and my God. He said, I'm not giving up. He said, I'm down. I'm probably as far down as a person can be. How did I get here? But I'm not giving up. You know the Holy Spirit of God, when you get saved, that light of the Spirit, that fire never goes out. You can quench the Spirit, you can grieve the Spirit, but you can never put out that fire, that Spirit that's on the inside. Some of you, man, some of us here, you know exactly what this testimony is. You've lived it. You've seen it. Now let's look at the last portion of it. Verse number 43. Look how verse chapter 43 begins. Judge me. Isn't that something? You know where the road to getting right starts? Judgment must first begin at the house of the Lord. Judge me. You know, you know where the road to revival begins? It begins whenever you begin to say, it's me, O oh Lord. It's not my brother. It's not my sister. It's not my neighbor. It's me, Lord. It's not those hypocrites up in Jerusalem. It's not these wicked, vile sinners all around me down here in the hill of Mizar. God, it's me. You see, David got in this condition because he got to look at other people. He got his eyes off of the Lord. And now he's, woe is me. What am I doing here? What's going on in my life? But now we're on the road to revival. Wouldn't you like to be on the road to revival? Judge me, O oh God, and plead my cause against an ungodly nation. O oh, deliver me from the deceitful and unjust man. You know what he said? He said, God, I don't belong in this crowd. You know, a child of God knows he doesn't belong in the hog pen. But yet he's not praying this prayer in a hypocritical way. He's saying, God, I'm right here in the midst of it. God, I'm just as guilty. For thou art the God of my strength. You know what you could also say there? He was saying, you're the God of my youth. He said, God, you listen, are you listening? He said, thou art the God of my strength. He said, I remember God whenever I could run through a troop. I could, God, I could do anything. And then I got proud, and I got arrogant, and I got haughty, and I thought, you know what, I, I can do this on my own. 
You know what David found himself? He found himself weak and human and mortal, just like we have to find ourselves that way. And he said, Thou art God my strength. Look what he said. Why dost thou cast me off? Why go I mourning because of the oppression of the enemy? What happened to me, God? Listen to me. The old saying is sin will take you further than you want to go. It'll keep you longer than you want to stay. It'll cost you more than you ever imagined you'd have to pay. Sin, when it's finished, bringeth forth life. No, death. The way of a transgressor is easy? No. Hard. My dad used to say so often, he'd say, your very first day is sin. That's your best day. He said, it just goes downhill from there. But then he would say with joy in his face, he said, your first day's walking with the God, with God. He said, that's difficult, maybe a little struggle. It's maybe a little, you gotta work at it a little bit. You gotta. He said, but it just gets better and better and better as the days go by. And I watched that in my dad's life. I watched the joy of the Lord on his face, and I could see it when he came to church, his testimony and his love for God and his love for souls. And that's the way, listen, that's what David's talking about here. Look what he said. Now, verse number three, look at it. This is so simple. I've read this thousands of times, but look what he said. He's praying now. Oh, send out thy light and thy truth. Let them do what? Lead me. David, do you know what he's saying? David said, I'm lost. Not lost, not lost is unsaved. He said, but I'm a lost, I'm a prodigal. He said, I don't know, God. He said, I've gone so far, I don't know what to do. He said, I'm like a blind man. God, would you guide me? God, I'm in the darkness. You know, as a child of God, you can get in the darkness and not know your way back. You know what you pray? God, send me the light. God, send the light. God, send the truth. Why? Because I need a guide. Amen. I need someone, God. I need something to take me by the hand and lead me back to the place where you'd have me to be. You know, we have a gracious and a merciful God that honestly believe that no matter how far as a child of God, you might ever find yourself estranged from where God would have you to be. That's what the word cast down means, estranged, away from God. One place God said to his children of Israel, he said, you've gone away backwards. He said, you thought you were watching me. And he said, and little by little, with your, Luke used to do that. When Luke learned to walk, he'd, he'd escape backwards. Y'all remember him doing that? He'd be looking right at you. And he'd walk away from him backwards. Once he got far enough away, he'd turn around and run. But he'd keep your eye. That's the way God's people, we escape. We're going away backwards. David said, are you look, looking at it? Verse 3, send out thy light and thy truth. Let them lead me. Let them bring me into thy holy hill and to thy tabernacle. Then will what? What's the next word? I. We're back. To, you, you know where the Christian life is lived? The Christian life is not lived in the multitude. If you wait to come to church to have revival, you won't have revival. You bring the revival to the church house. Amen. You know where revival takes place in the life of a Christian? Alone with God. As the heart panteth after the water brook, so my soul panteth after thee, O God. You know what made David? Not the multitude, not the crowd, but of being alone with God. Your fellowship with God, your time alone with God is what's going to make you or break you as a Christian. If you wait to get to church to get your spiritual temperature right, checked and raised up, it won't happen. You'll get disappointed. I promise you. If you come to church and you're waiting on somebody there to encourage you, you might be fortunate enough to find some encouragement. But lots of times some of you hurt your feelings, offend you. 
Do you know your fellowship with the Lord is never based on other people's spirit? It's, it's always the same. You know, you'll never go as a believer to meet the Lord in the morning and the Lord will say, you know what, I don't have time for you today. And you'll never walk away from a meeting with the Lord and pursuit of the Lord and time with the Lord and walk away disappointed. Because His mercies are new every, every morning, every day. Amen? Look what He said. Then will I, I, then will I go unto the altar of God, unto God my what? Exceeding joy. That's a long way from why art thou cast down, O my soul? Why art thou disquieted within me? Now we're talking about exceeding joy. Wouldn't you like to live there? You know what? That's available to each and every one of us as people, as Christians. You won't have exceeding joy because of your Christian friends. And you sure won't find exceeding joy running away from God. But if we'll run to God and put ourselves on the altar before God and say, God, help me. God, guide me. God, direct me. Look what he said. My exceeding joy. Yea, upon the harp will I praise thee, O God, my God. Hey, David got his song back. Amen. The psalmist of Israel, verse number five, for the last time. Last time, why art thou cast down, O my soul? And why art thou disquieted within me? Hope in God, for I shall yet praise him who is the health of my countenance and my God. You know what? David never gave up on his confidence that God was the key to his life. And you know what? I, I believe that this, these two chapters reveal to us the way back from a place you should never have gone. No child of God ought to ever go to the place where the enemies of God daily afflict you. We ought not be that way. We ought not put ourselves in that situation where we're under the constant influence of the devil and the devil and his crowd are constantly saying, where's your God? Where's your God? The place where the devil is trying to shake your very faith in God. But it might happen. But thank God we have a God who's great enough to send the light, to come to where we are, and lead us back to where he wants us. Amen? That's the God I serve. That's the God of your salvation. The same God that found David where he was, where he should never have been, and let him back. You know what David said in his last days? He said, I will yet praise him more and more. I like this, and I don't have the verse before me. You can read the Psalms yourself and find it. There's only 150 of them, so this will be your homework assignment. One place when David was young, he said this, I shall not be moved. Boy, that sounds good, doesn't it? I shall not be moved. And then later on, you'll read this verse. I shall not be greatly moved. <laughs> There's a little bit of a difference between, hey, you can't move me, but you can't move me much. And you know what? There's a lot of us say, well, I'll tell you what, I'll never, I'll never do. And you have to look back and say, you know what? I did. But God never gave up on me. God never quit loving me. God never let me go. And I will yet praise him more and more. You ever find yourself in that place where you say, what happened to me? Well, hopefully this message will come back to you and you'll remember it. Maybe you can look back and see that place and say, you know what? I remember that day when I realized, hey, I'm in the wrong place. And God, by his grace and his mercy, reached down and came to you where you were and began to lead you back as a believer to the place where God would have you to be. If you, if you don't know the Lord, if you're an unbeliever, if you're not saved, I've got good news for you. God knows exactly where you are, and he'll save you just as you are. Just as I am without one plea. I'm glad that God saves sinners, aren't you? And I'm glad that God never gives up on his children. If you think that you're going to get through this life unscathed, 
You're never going to, the Bible says, I was wounded in the house of my friends. You don't have to go to the bar to get your feelings hurt. You don't have to go to the world to get discouraged. You can get discouraged at the house of God. Been many a preacher want to quit because of, quote unquote, God's people. It's not the world that discourages most Christians. Most of the time, Christians get discouraged in the company of those that keep the holy days. But then they make a mistake. They begin to wander away from God. Then they find themselves way out in the world to the point where they begin to question the very faith that they know for a fact, but they begin to question it until one day God makes it all real personal again. And their mind is not on everybody else, but all of a sudden their mind is on me. God judge me. It's me, O oh Lord. It's me, God. And once we get the focus back on ourselves, God begins to work and move in our life. And that's how to go from ruin to revival. That's how to get from, hey, happened to me to hey let me tell you what happened to me let me tell you what God did for me amen let me tell you how God saved me not saved my soul but how God saved my life from ruin and how God gave me an opportunity a fresh and new to serve him dear heavenly father thank you for this day thank you for loving us dear lord God it's, I don't know how we made it to past 12 lord I didn't even realize it was that late Thank you for watching over us, Lord. Please help us, we pray. God, help this message, Lord, to make a difference in the lives of your people. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Would you stand? I didn't realize it was 12 minutes, 10 minutes after some of the